We are live <laughs> with another week of uh, another week of Legal Tech Week, the Journalist Roundtable, where we talk about the week's top news. This is uh, it is uh, December eleventh, twenty twenty, and this is Bob Ambrogi. I am uh, the uh, author of the blog Law Sites and the host of the podcast Law Next, and our usual. Uh, you, we're minus two. To we're minus our Victor and Victoria today, but. Uh, Otherwise, we're all here. Uh, if you want to introduce yourselves, let's see. Joe, you want to start? Sure. Uh, Joe Patrice from Above the Law uh, and the Thinking Like a Lawyer podcast and, of course, this show. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's hard to believe that we're in December. Uh, happy to uh, discuss some legal tech with everybody. Mostly known I don't really have anything funny. Yeah. Mo mostly yeah. known for this show, but those other that Above the Law thing True. is pretty good, too. It's out there, you know. Yeah. Uh, Nikki. My name is Nikki Black. I am the legal technology evangelist with my case law practice management software. I, uh, and in my day job, I am, a, <laughs> I am also a legal technology journalist and I write columns, uh, a monthly column for the ABA journal, bi-weekly column for Above the Law, weekly column for the Daily Record. And I also post weekly on the My Case blog and I never have anything funny to say. You guys always outdo me. This week, Joe did, not except he started the whole thing off with a killer, so killer joke. So that's credit yeah, but, for that. But you are also <laughs> always in the most beautiful houses, so that's. Oh come on, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Zach. Hey everybody, I'm Zach Warren. Uh, my side gigs when I'm not here on the webcast are I'm the editor in chief of Legal Tech News, a magazine with ALM. You can also see me on other ALM publications like Law.com, The American Lawyer, Corporate Counsel, etc. And Caroline. Hi, Caroline Hill, editor in chief of Legal IT Insider. I don't know why I'm so busy the whole time. I just write for Legal IT Insider. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're global and based in the UK. <laughs> All right. Uh, Molly? Molly McDonough. I am a media and content strategist based in the Chicago area and producer of Legal Talk Today. And last but not least, Steve. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Steve Embry. I uh, write the blog Tech Law Crossroads about legal innovation and disruption in the legal, legal ecosystem. Prior to that, I practiced law as a litigator with the AmLaw 200 firm for more years than I want to admit right now, but finally saw the light and, uh, and became a, as they say, recovering lawyer. <laughs> And as always, uh, those of you who are uh, watching and listening, uh, please uh, share your thoughts in the chat. If you have things you'd like us to talk about or think about, uh, put them there. But uh, I think, kind of think the top story of the week, or at least uh, certainly of the day, is the fact that Ross Intelligence, the AI legal research startup, I don't know how long you call somebody a startup, but uh, the startup uh, that's been around for six years at, at least, uh, they're shutting down uh, in, the, in the face of this uh, lawsuit by Thomson Reuters, uh, which was filed against them back in uh, what May it was. And uh, they're vowing they're going to continue to fight the lawsuit. Uh, they've apparently got uh, litigation insurance that's going to enable them to do that. But other than that, as of January 31st, they are winding down operations with, with some teaser of, a, of, a, of, of, a, of, a, of words from uh, Andrew Arruda, the CEO, that maybe they'll be back or they might be back, depending on what happens with the, with the lawsuit. I, I'm not quite sure what to make of that. But for now, they are shutting down. So uh, I, I don't know. I, you know, this is uh, uh, it's. It's it's an I have an weird reactions to this because as much as I you know like to try and be a a, a quote unquote neutral journalist I've, I've you know gotten to know them all I've pretty much followed them from the earliest days they got started uh, you know went up to their Toronto offices last year and met a whole bunch of the staff up there uh, and you know they're good people and they were trying hard and they had an interesting product and they um, really kind of helped put AI on the legal map in a way. I mean, you know, it, it was uh, a few years ago, you couldn't go to a legal tech conference or a legal conference of any kind without somebody from Ross, usually Andrew there talking about AI and they were a real kind of a leading voice and proponent for it. So uh, 
uh, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the same time, there is this, there is this lawsuit. Uh, I'm not sure what West's uh, Thomson Reuters motives are really in bringing it, whether it is anti-competitive as Ross says, or whether there's some legitimate, uh, reason to try and protect uh, intellectual property here or something else at play. Uh, what do y'all think? Should we, should we run through a little bit like of, of like the, so so they it's obviously copyright infringement um saying that they t- t- um that Ross created a derivative work from Westlaw they um and there's so many interesting strands to it so you did a really good piece Bob on the on in the beginning of November where the judge questioned um whether the claim was complete speculation um yeah, which yeah. and the, the facts of that case were really interesting so TR so their their point is, um, you know, why would you that Ross had used a company called Legalese to access Westlaw and they weren't allowed to access it as a competitor, but they had done. There doesn't seem to be any dispute that that happened. Um, TL's point is, why would they do that? There's well, I think there is dispute that I, I, I'm not sure Ross agrees that they got anything from Legalese. Yeah, and then this the, is, the, this the, is the interesting point, right? There, there's so much rides on this, right? So TL's point is why, so this is where, and, and I suppose, you know, do we need to delve into the facts of the case? But as, as you've, you know, I think it is important to sort of analyze because I think there should be consequences going forward if it's anti-competitive, right? So I think mm-hmm. I think that, so TR say they accessed Westlaw, right? Just the very fact that they did that is enough because why would they do that? They're, so Ross's point is they didn't get any value from it. TR was saying, well, you accessed it. Then there's a lot of questions about, so it's the head notes and key numbers. Like, there's a lot of questions over what is it even copyright? So it's a bit mm-hmm. of a mis- you know, it's a bit of a messy case anyway. Yeah. Like, what is the value? What is the copyright? There's already been like the judge seems to be <laughs> sliding a little bit with Ross. But then and then now it's like, you know, going forward, I mean, so it raises so many questions that so should you as it just because you're a really big established player. I don't think that there should be a suggestion that if some startup comes along and does commit copyright infringement, that you shouldn't be able to go for them. But but equally, if, as the case now, thankfully, Ross is able to continue with their insurance, if it is found that they there is no claim, there's no merit, and that this is, in effect, vexatious, I think that there should be serious consequences in order to deter, to deter anything like that happening again, because clearly it, it is real it has a real effect on innovation you know will another ross want to come you know risk you know peeing off tr so i think there should be serious consequences if it, if the judge further down the line finds that it's anti-competitive i think that that should be called out what does i don't know what anyone else thinks about that mm-hmm. um so so i i'm just gonna say um a fun thing about American litigation is we're <laughs> all about bullying people into submission. Uh, that there should be consequences for it. There, there will not be consequences for it, even if that's what happens. Unfortunately, that's yeah, I mean, we do have Rule Eleven in the federal courts, which uh, prohibits yes. uh, parties from bringing frivolous litigation. And, and um, uh, I, I think as you've been watching the news, frivolous <laughs> litigation appears to be getting by pretty <laughs> yeah. well without any consequences. Right. And sanctions are so hard to get ever for and pretty right. much anything. It's yeah. hard to get sanctions. Yeah, That's really interesting. So there's no grounds on which it could be deemed to be anti-competitive or anything. You know, there'd be no. I mean, that's it's crazy, isn't it? Because it, there is nothing then to deter. <laughs> Why would yeah. TR not? Like it just is a no-brainer. Yeah. But am I yeah. the only one that thinks that maybe there is a little bit here that we don't know because you don't see fast case um, getting sued by them. If they're just really trying to go after all their competitors, you don't see them suing case tax. You know, it's this, this idea that, oh, they're just suing all the, the up and coming people. I'm not sure I necessarily buy that. And I also, I think it's convenient that they do apparently have lit- insurance that is presumably covering the costs of the litigation. Granted, it takes time to meet with your lawyers and plan and provide discovery and all that, correct. But that being said, you know, they've been around for four years. A lot's been said about them. They've got a lot of press for four years. Um, and you would think that they would be close to being at least have enough income to cover their expenses, maybe not profitable, but getting towards that stage rather than after all the investments they've gotten just thrown up their hands because, oh, it's a lawsuit. So I wonder yeah. a little bit about that. And the only other thing I'll add is the few times this has occurred with other companies, I've never been particularly surprised. I've been like, ah, that's not super surprising. I feel the same way about this one. And that's all I have to say about that. 
So. Yeah, I, um, I sort of feel the same way. I think there's there may be more to the story than than what appears. You know, I, I'm kind of like you, Bob. I mean, I, I, I know Andrew. I've heard him speak. He's an articulate, bright guy. He's likable. I mean, he's one of my favorite people, right? And it's it's hard sometimes to to be objective when you have somebody like that with a startup. But you know, a couple of things first. I mean, let's not forget uh, startups and being an entrepreneur are, they're not for the faint of heart. Uh, There are more failures than successes. Mm -hmm. And just like here, you have to assume that there will be unexpected events and things, you know, to be blunt about it, shit happens, you know, and uh, sometimes you can do something about it. And sometimes you can't, Um, you know, you, you look back over the history of, lots of companies and there have been these kinds of fights for years. I mean, you know, Apple, Samsung, Apple, Microsoft. I mean, it, it's sort of a little bit part of the territory, but, you know, I, I, I wonder uh, when Ross started, they were a great idea and great concept. And as time's gone, has gone on, they seem to have been um, surpassed maybe is the right term by some of the other players like fast case in, in the field. Um, and I yeah. don't quite know what to make of that, but, you know, personally, I, I, I feel really bad and I'm really sorry for Andrew and his team because you, you hate to see something like this happen to, to such good people. Yeah. I, I, you know, the, when they, when Tom Snorris first filed the lawsuit, they, they filed the lawsuit, what was it like a week or something after settling the lawsuit with legalese, which was the party with which Ross was uh, allegedly complicit in this, uh, you know, alleged theft of, of copyright. And, and so, it, and that was a consent judgment uh, against legalese. Uh, so, so it, it, it did make you think that there had to be something there that they got out of that lawsuit that they was becoming the basis of their lawsuit against, against Ross. But then the complaint, there's like nothing, there's no there there and there's no meat in the complaint. And in that hearing that I wrote about the hearing on the motion to dismiss where the judge, you know, essentially said, you know, this, this sounds like you're just speculating here. And the, the attorney, the attorney for Thomson Reuters response was that it was a plausible inference. I mean, they, they're still not pointing to any facts here, which is, it just seems strange. I, I, I it's hard to, hard to make sense of it. I think that's what bothers me most about it is this is that that there there doesn't seem to be even from TR's side a really strong line. Um, it's just the argument that they couldn't have done it so fast. They had to have copied us is the is the is the basis of the of the main complaint. I'm not saying there's not something there. And, you know, the judge said what I think, you know, ought to happen next, which is we'll see in discovery. Um and, you know, <laughs> but I do, but my biggest problem is, you know, something that Caroline mentioned and, and Joe mentioned is that there is really no remedy if, if Ross didn't do anything wrong and they were, you know, perfectly innocent in their development, you know, did, did a lawsuit just destroy a company? I yeah. think to your point, no, <clears throat> to your point, go back to, to go back to, uh, it's, so they, they are saying about the very fact that Ross used, went through legal aids, which as Bob said, they settled. There's, there, there's, those, fa- those, facts, those facts aren't in dispute, right? So, so Ross accessed TR's content through an intermediary. Right. And just the very fact, so, uh, so from TR's point of view, I think that they have a very, that they are saying in effect that that in itself, in the, the fact that they did that, is, is, is okay fine then you know they haven't got hard evidence of, of copyright but they're saying that that in effect is, is enough to show that there was bad behavior in effect like why was Ross a competitor who knew they weren't able to access Westlaw going via an intermediary to access it and then you know the, it's almost like it's very hard to then prove exactly what was you know what, what happened after that but yeah. they're saying that the very fact that they did it is should be enough to bring a claim and I kind of I must be honest with you I have some sympathy I mean I really like the team and I like competition and like yeah. But actually, I kind of have some. some but my understanding is that Ross says that they their position is they didn't hire legalese to get this content and give them uh, Westlaw content. They hired legalese to kind of prepare the question and answer sets that they were going to use 
in yeah. preparing their own artificial intelligence that, you know, the whole idea of, of Ross was you would be able to ask it a question and get an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what they were, what, what legalese was doing was researching, was sort of crafting and writing supposedly these questions and answers. And I mean, I think Ross is saying, you know, and so legalese is saying, well, in order to do that, we had to go in and do all this research in, in Westlaw to, to do all this, but we weren't copying it. So, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't think that they necessarily just concede that th that what Thompson Reuters says was going on was going on. I, I think no, they, I, they portray I, I, it I, differently. I, yeah. different. I'm not, not necessarily, I know clearly Ross has put up a very strong defense and, and continues to do so. But my point, I suppose, was, Looking at it more from TR's point of view, that they have, they I think going to Morley's point that they had that their their sort of their their case was slightly stronger than just going on. You know, I I think that I mean it's very it's very complex, very messy. Um, I think, I Andrew, think we have, we have Andrew, Andrew Aruda in the audience yeah. here, so he's uh, he's <laughs> monitoring. <laughs> you know, I think he just posted uh, uh, the statement. It's really interesting. Me, you know? It's really interesting that they brought the the action after. Uh, after after a judgment with legalese. I can't tell you the number of times over the years that I've been involved in cases where there are multiple potential parties and uh, a plaintiff might settle with one of the parties really in essence to buy cooperation and, and evidence to use against other parties. And I don't know if that's what happened here, but boy, that's, uh, that's not unusual for that kind of ploy to, to be made. And, so, it can be yeah. quite dangerous. <laughs> so, Steve, that's kind of what I was expecting and just did not see that materialize. Yeah. So, well, you know, yeah, I, I yeah. was expecting kind of that pattern, and mm -hmm. that's not what we've seen, at least so yeah. far. So, But, a, but yeah. a motion to dismiss is different than a motion for summary judgment right. in terms of the levels, in terms of what you have to prove. And right. also, uh, and so essentially, you just have to, it's a lower bar there. You don't have to bring all your evidence on a motion to dismiss. It just has to show that there's some evidence that the claim can go forward. You and, just have to show that there is a claim. Yeah, a valid right. Claim. Yeah. So they're, they're not going to throw all their evidence on the table right. for that. And essentially, they're making a race it's a locator argument, right? You know, it. the thing speaks for itself. The fact that this company was hired by a competitor mm -hmm. um, and accessed the systems, they're ba basically saying the thing speaks for itself. Probably the fact that this um, uh, legally settled, settled, they probably do have some evidence that they're going to lay on the table when they get to the summary judgment motion or use it during a deposition um, uh, they're, or they're going to very carefully lay the groundwork for the deposition, ask all these questions, and then provide that as in, um, in material that disputes on a summary judgment or as impeachable material at a trial. That's where I think they're going on this. I mean, I litigated for a number of years and I was a public defender and I was a civil litigator. And I think that, you know, that some ways you're, there's a difference between a motion to dismiss and, and a motion for summary judgment. And it's highly likely, in my opinion, that they've got some evidence um, mm. that they're just not laying on the table yet because it's but, a strategic but, decision. I mean, again, she, the, they're, the attorney for Thompson Reuters at this hearing, I, I talked about what she said about plausible inference. I mean, she later said in that same argument, she said, she's quote, I, she said, I mean, why would they go through all this if they didn't use it? I, I, I mean, again, it's, she's conject. It sounds like she's conjecturing. And if she's got any kind of evidence, why, why would she withhold it at that point? There's no, I can't think of any strategic reason to withhold it at the motion to dismiss stage. Yeah, e even if you don't have evidence, uh, like it, I mean, it's motion to dismiss stage. It's do these allegations, if true, lead to a claim? And the allegation is, well, we think it's plausible, is not an allegation that if true, like, is enough. I, like, I, well, it, it's survived it the motion suspect. to dismiss. It, sound, it sounds like, it, it, sounds like it, yeah. it, it sounds like they, um, wasn't it the fact that they, um, they, it's almost like they didn't quite put the case as clearly as well as they, they should have. Like, the, <laughs> didn't the, I think the judge, I don't know whether the judge actually gave them, because the motion was dismissed, but I think the, was the judge going to give them, um, to suggest that they amend the claim, amend their claim? Well, that, I think that's right. That's a possibility. This, I mean, the judge hasn't yeah. ruled yet on that, on that okay. motion, but yeah, yeah certainly a possibility like, would be to tell them to go back and yeah. amend the complaint. Yeah, because uh, it seemed like they, it was just, it seemed like perhaps what was put down in writing was not... <laughs> Um, you know, needed to be made out more clearly. Um, and because you're right, if that, if you, <laughs> it's not good enough to just sort of say, oh, well, what else, what, what else would they be doing? You know, I think that they need to state their case more clearly, but. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, another kind of, I think irony in all this is that uh, I think the dirty little secret of, of, of legal research startups all over the place is they've, 
you know, there's an argument to be made. They all got their stuff originally out of, <laughs> out of Westlaw uh, in one way, shape or form or another, because there had been way back when a, a pirated copy of Westlaw that was circulating around in the, in kind of the early days of, of uh, some of the electronic development of some of these materials uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of people conjecture has uh, sort of subsequently been the, the seed set of uh, primary law cases and statutes for pretty much every legal tech company that's come along since then. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't, we don't talk about that. It's, it's sort of something if, I mean, if you ask any of the major, not major, any of the sort of, you know, the, 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 mid-tier legal tech companies out, or legal uh, research companies out there, uh, Case Text or, or Fast Case or, or any of the others, where they got their materials originally, uh, they won't tell you that. They won't answer that question. Some of us are old enough to remember having to research Westlaw head notes in, uh-huh. there is the thought, books. <laughs> right. I think certainly if you speak to law firms, um, who feel very strongly about um, the, that have felt very strongly about the cost being, speaking completely frankly, we all know speaking, the feel very strongly about the cost and the need for innovation in this area. Um, you know, I think that there'll be some disappointment Oops. among, oh, sorry, have you lost me? I didn't mean that. No, I didn't mean that. Um, I think there'll be some disappointment at the, I think that the, there certainly is a need for, we need to, you know, there is a need for more choice and um so i think it's a shame from that point of view i know thompson Rogers do an awful lot of work and spend an awful lot of money um and i'm not suggesting by any means that you know they should be like should be open season on Westlaw. but you know i'm very very, very much pro choice from a for, for the law firm's perspective so from that point of view it's a, it's a real shame so uh, sarah glassmeyer um said something in the in the uh to the panelists about uh how closed law inhibits um, innovation and not only innovation, but access. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is a becoming kind of a tech problem with a tech solution um, that, that is not going to be as much of an issue, except that private companies can still, you know, package and publish the information in a, in a way that's, that they should be able to make money off of. Yeah. I guess, you know, and then ultimately they, what, what could be, it'll be interesting to see how this all turns out because it, it, it certainly could come back to haunt Thomson Reuters uh, if, if the case doesn't go the way they'd like it to. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, in, it's interesting to see Ross challenging, uh, you know, again, Thomson Reuters knows it can't copyright the cases and it can't copyright the statutes. Uh, and its whole case is built on these ancillary materials, the head notes and the key number system. Um, and no, uh, I, yeah. I think Bob, it probably will come back to haunt Thompson Reuters because um, irrespective of the outcome of the case, I mean, just listening to the panelists, I mean, there's, there's a groundswell of support for Ross just because of the dynamics of it. I mean, it, right. it clearly looks like, on its face without knowing the facts that a a big, huge company is trying to squash a competitor. And I mean, that's, that's a public relations problem, right? I mean, that's not publicity that you want, uh, particularly in this space where there's lots of competition. So, you know, I I thought when the case was filed that I thought, you know, that that's not a good, that doesn't give you a good impression of Thomson Reuters, right? Quite honestly. (laughs) Right. Yep. Yeah, the David versus Goliath narrative of all this is really what's interesting to me because it's something that you talk about in other parts of legal uh, technology, like relativity, 800 pound gorilla and e-discovery. But I think pretty much every other part of legal tech kind of compares to Thompson, Lexis, Bloomberg versus Ross, fast case, case text. The backing that these companies have just by nature of being a small part of a much larger Fortune 500 company, um, it much more easily lends itself to that narrative. Whether that's true in the litigation, who knows, but I think that will be the prevailing narrative. And I think it was smart for Ross, just from a pure PR standpoint, to really hone in on that from the start. Yeah, yeah. Well, any uh, any last words on... Uh on this uh, 
I'm sure it's not the last we're going to, certainly not the last we're going to hear about it for sure. <laughs> we're going to continue to follow it, but. Uh, what else? Uh, what else was in the news this week? Uh, other good news: the shutting down of Benjamin Moore's legal department. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, I've been thinking about that a lot, and it, you know, it it was an interesting reaction to it because um, almost everybody's said, that's the craziest damn thing I've ever heard of. What are you, are you kidding me? Um, and very little, uh, you know, sort of, well, let's, let's think about this a little bit in terms of, you know, is this a viable option for, for companies? Um, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I was going to write a post one time and I never, never did it about what, what an in-house legal department would look like if a business person was in charge of it. Uh, who was who did not have a law degree, and I, I, I thought it always been, it would look a lot different, right? Um, so you know, you, you look across the mix of technology tools like the contract automation uh, tools that uh, uh, Black Boiler is developing. You got some more patents this week, um, and the, the ability to to highlight and find uh, uh, clauses that that parties are mostly agreed to. And then uh, earlier this week, LexisNexis came out with this uh, new uh, practice guide survey of commercial lease terms, which, you know, they're, they're gathering the data from, from private law firms and, and businesses, and then they're, they're making it anonymous, but they're providing all these sorts of insights. And I, my first thought as a litigator is, you know, can they do that for litigation and settlements? Ooh, <laughs> that would be cool. But the point uh, that uh, I was making is, you know, you, you start looking at all these tools that business people can use that gets them further along in the negotiating or litigation process than they ever could before. And so that may mean that the in-house legal department does not have the same sort of, of role and dominance that it that it once did as business people begin using these tools. I mean, I, I, we all know any number of people who don't have law degrees, who are in the legal tech space, in legal process management, who would be perfectly capable of running a in-house legal department and allocating tasks and determining tasks and who should do tasks based, based upon a robust process management system. Um, and, you know, I don't know the story about Benjamin Moore and what they did, but, you know, it's entirely feasible that someone could sit down and say, let's look at our mix of uh, legal matters. Let's determine what we can do uh, without a lawyer. Let's determine the cost of the in-house department. And that, let's look at the cost of pushing everything else out to lawyers themselves and outside firms. And that cost benefit analysis may may turn toward not having a legal department or at least a limited legal department. So I don't know that, you know, it, it looks sort of like a petulant sort of CEO at Benjamin Moore said, I get to get rid of them all. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. And I'm not sure what it bodes for, for the future. Um, so, you know, I think it, it was just interesting to me that so many people on the cutting edge of innovation immediately said, well, that's crazy. You can't do that. God, you got to have an in-house counsel. And I didn't see too many people say, you know, let's, let's think about this. Maybe that would be an option for certain groups. Um, the, the firm that was named as the outside counsel, by the way, is the Littler Mendelssohn firm, which is a labor and employment law firm. They know right. that's what they do. And so that would suggest to me that a lot of what uh, Benjamin Moore was facing in terms of legal issues was in the labor and employment arena. Um, but again, I have no inside information, but I just uh, thought it was kind of interesting that uh, what they did and what will, what will come of it. Yeah, I think it's one of those that I'm waiting for a little bit more information to come out because kind of to your point, you still do need that point person there, even if it is a business person, to be able to get everybody on the right track and make right. sure that your outside counsel, contract lawyers, et cetera, 
are actually working toward a unified goal. Um, when Benjamin Moore laid off everybody, they didn't exactly say whether there was going to be still right. a legal operations manager or project manager or something in-house. So if you're just literally outsourcing everything, I think that's probably where a lot of the confusion and a lot of the hold on, wait a minute comes from, mm -hmm. just because it kind of seems like a little bit of a rudderless ship over there as compared to just a transfer of who exactly is going to be running things. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, think, that's right. that's I think that's true, Zach, for sure. But um, it, but at the same time, you know, when you start, when companies are starting to view legal as a business service, um, then then it makes more sense for them to start shifting that work somewhere else um, or with their other business services. And that's where kind of I'm starting to, that's part of the argument of the big four that they can come in and do some of that too. That's not what's happening here, but I'm, you know, I, these are the arguments we're seeing develop in that space. So it, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how they, how they do that, whether there's deeper problems in the company. And um, I mean, it sounds to me from the reporting that there were, there are other issues, uh, too. So, you know, it's hard to say to use this kind of one example. Um, I think I was surprised just because it didn't seem like that big of a deal. You know, I've covered for decades <laughs> at this point, shifts from in-house, bulking up your in-house department to getting rid of your entire in-house department, out, having an outside um, uh, general counsel housed in a law firm. You know, I like there are these arrangements exist and they seem to be separate cyclical. So I can't tell if that's part of that here too, you know, just taking the in-house people, getting an outside general counsel as a, as a project manager to, to manage the firms. It did seem like that they, that it's Littler's not the only one that they will, that there's somebody who's going to have to be managing their, their. Well, it, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. I've, I've watched that pendulum swing too, back and <laughs> forth several times. And, you know, the difference it seems to me now though, is that the tools that are available to limit lawyer involvement in lots of matters are are becoming so sophisticated and, and robust that um, you know the what could be done and, and it may be a question also of you know legal operations people who who will fulfill more of a role within the in-house legal department than they did before that can manage you know these this disaggregation and this multiple uh, ability of providers to supply services um, in a more efficient manner. But it's an interesting concept. We'll see what happens. It kind of goes in the face. I mean, so far the pendulum has been swinging toward bigger and, and better in-house legal departments as opposed to no legal department. <laughs> but to me, this is exactly, this is exactly what occurred to me because um, I've thought for quite a while, like we saw after the financial crisis, you know, law firms weren't listening to, to the needs of the corporates and they kept their prices the same and they, they weren't responsive and the in-house teams grew and we saw the swing, as you said. And recently we've seen law firms, you know, in many cases really get that, you know, they, they have, they are investing, typically they, they're, they're becoming way more sophisticated, they're investing in technology, they've got a vaster array of tech at their disposal, they're creating, in many cases, their own ALSPs. And apart from, I think that that point is a good one in terms of it's surprising not to have anyone to ma manage, you know, but and get rid of the whole lot. But actually, you know, I, I wonder how many other firms, um, sorry, other corporates where, you know, I mean, it suggests that things are not going well, right? Like if you if you have a team that have got good executive buy-in and, and uh, you know, have a really good place at the board, this is not going to, I don't know the circumstances, but you'd suggest it wouldn't happen. But I do wonder, I do feel like this pendulum is going to swing back to law firms in many cases, um, particularly perhaps smaller legal departments that don't have legal ops heads um, and don't, you know, have a great, the great array of technology at their disposal, don't have necessarily the language. I feel like they, they feel like I, the, what I'm hearing from law firms is that they're increasingly advising corporates not just on the law, but on how to run their own legal department. And if they're doing that anyway, then why aren't they doing it? If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. I, 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 I so my perspective on this stuff is always so much colored by the fact that my wife worked in a corporate legal department, and uh, all I could ever uh, see through her was uh, that how much more 
cost effective it was to do things in house than to bring in somebody from outside uh, when when they could be done in house when there was the capability or expertise there because it just seemed like outside firms would just automatically charge uh, you know uh, double or more uh, what it would cost them to do it in house. Uh, that's and, that's yeah. actually an interesting point, Bob, because you know we we went from in house counsel saying. You know, it's not cost effective for outside counsel to do this. And now we may be getting business people looking at their in-house counsel departments and saying, is it really necessary for you to be performing this task as opposed to outsourcing it or somebody else within the business that doesn't have the same kind of cost center? And, you know, it's compounded by the fact that that most of these in-house counsel at one point work for law firms and are certainly trained as lawyers and have that that sort of mindset. So, um, so we may be seeing, yeah, a contraction within businesses themselves as business people start putting the, the steady eye on their legal departments. Yeah. I feel like this is going to go one of two ways and they're both going to be bad for everybody. I feel like either <laughs> like, like I, I actually think that I understand that technology and stuff means that you can get pared down your legal department, but getting rid of it entirely, I think, so this goes one of two ways, either, Littler gets to basically write a blank check to itself and say like, oh no, we just need to do all this stuff. You just got to keep paying for it. Or, and maybe also after a while, it's going to flip the other way. And some random executive who has no idea how law works is going to start saying, I refuse to pay. I mean, how could a motion to dismiss take you more than five minutes to write? Like it, <laughs> it's going to get back. Like there needs to be an adult in the room. And by adult, I mean somebody with a law degree because I mean, I'm snobby that way. But somebody in the room has to know how this business works. Uh, you can't just go to a vendor and turn it all over to them, you know? Well, they can just use that case text motion drafting uh AI application, and it will only take them five minutes to do the motion. Yes, that's fair. That is fair. <laughs> Where's Benjamin? Benjamin today's, is a Berkshire. Today's uh, company, so. sponsored by Case Tax. The way. <laughs> ben, Benjamin yeah. Moore is a Berkshire Hath Hathaway company who is not known to yeah. be terribly shy about cutting costs to the extreme. <laughs> yeah. Um, so another, actually, another story this week that kind of relates maybe back in a sense to the raw story in terms of access to uh, public uh, legal information is the fact that the uh, House uh, approved, uh, passed the Open Courts Act, which uh, which is described as uh, providing, uh, making PACER free for the first time. Uh, Molly, you had, you want, do you want to talk about that a little bit or? Oh, I just think it, you know, we talked a little bit about it last week. I think, I don't know if we talked about it before or during the, during the program. Um, I, I just think it's interesting that I, I don't think we had talked about, we talked about the letter, but not the, the fact that the house had passed it that hadn't happened yet. Yeah. Um, but now the numbers are starting to come out and the, the um, administrative office had been kind of throwing out this $2 billion number over several years and um, the government accountability office is now saying, you know, there'll be a kind of initial um, um, development to turn it, pub to make this public, but that um, it's really going to be about a million dollars a year to run to make it public. And then there'll be a commercial component. So the, the, the um, PACER will still be able to recoup a significant part of that by being able to pack, sell licenses to uh, commercial vendors. So, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's, it just doesn't make sense to, to me anymore not to make it public, <laughs> you right. know, give the benefit, make law that's supposed to be public and accessible to the public actually public and accessible. Um, you know, if just because it's public doesn't mean that it's accessible and, and that, and we've been talking about that too. It's, you know, we have a lot of public information that, that no one can actually get access to. And especially people who um, really can't afford to, to pay uh, for lawyers uh, and court records to be able to handle, to even determine whether they have a case um, at a, at a cost effective uh at a price point that they can afford um, before they even hire a lawyer. Yeah. Um, Joe, I know you wrote about that last week. Did you have anything, any further thoughts on that or any other? I, I was actually going back to see if I had some like great pithy line from that article last week, but yeah, no, like it was, I, I just can't get over this thing. Like when they sent around that, 
two billion uh, talking point thing. It just it was it was so shocking to me that they would they they would make up a number like that because. It would be entirely reasonable to say it's too expensive. It might cost thirty million dollars a year, which, while also a lie, would at least be plausible. Uh, the idea that running a database of static static PDFs would cost two billion was just so absurd that it, I, I it's it was just unbelievable. I, I mean, I guess it's twenty twenty. I guess I should have believed it. Yeah. I was about to say, I've seen recent payments to DOJ lawyers and current lawsuits. I don't know. $2 billion doesn't seem too unreasonable. <laughs> uh, what what well, else? You know, uh, there yeah, seems, ahead, to be this, seems to be this view that even if you're running a government service, you know, the service ought to make money. But I mean, there's some government services that are there because they are services, you know, mm-hmm. and you, you can't, because of the people that they serve and the functions that they perform, it's not particularly reasonable for them to make money. Um, and, yeah. but, you know, now in these days and times, it seems like oh, every, every service has to make money or it's not viable. And that's not really the function of government, it, at least in my view, not to get political. I know. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I think it was, was it Joe, wasn't your article that referred to it as a slush fund? Yeah, although it actually, <laughs> it, it, and that wasn't even my term. A uh, slush fund was actually in the, um, in, I think it was one of the things that was said in the federal circuit. I think one of the judges in the federal circuit oral argument was like, isn't this just a slush fund? <laughs> All right. Um, some other stories. Uh, Caroline, what's, what's happening over in the UK this week? Sorry, I lost control of my mouth. Um, yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's just the story of my life right now, including the fact that so um, this week, uh, DWF, which is a UK London Stock Exchange listed law firm, um, had disclosed its half year results. Um, I was supposed to have published it, but due to my own tech issues, which you're all familiar with, um, I've actually not published it, so it's coming out, so you're getting a preview. But to be fair, that. To be fair, their results were out. It's just me that hasn't written about it yet. But um, that'll be out on Monday. But I spoke to what was interesting about it, right? So they're, um, I haven't got it in front of me, so to paraphrase. So their, their results um, are, are were up by over 15% in revenue increase, um, which as we all know, like at the moment with COVID, it's pretty pretty significant. Their, their profit was up by in double digits. And what was really interesting reading through some of the sort of subtext um, was the fact that the reason why their results are so good, they they attribute that to their managed services um, division um, and they're connected. They've got these different names. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite painful. So I'm just trying to work out what everything is and where it all fits. But so they've got managed services, which kind of is pretty self-explanatory, um, connected services, which is everything they do, which is tech, client-facing tech. Um, and those two things have contributed significantly to the bottom line. So managed services, they bought um, a company. So obviously being listed, they can you know, operate as, as a corporate. Um, and don't, we, don't, we don't anyway in the UK have the same constraints as you know as the US. Right. But um, so they've acquired a legal services. They acquired earlier this year a legal services company called Mindcrest, which has been established. It's actually from based in Chicago. You all, you all know it. It's um, probably it was established um, two thousand and one, and it's got a great it's got a great presence in India. And they've currently got five hundred people in India. And they in the results, yes, uh, two days ago, they um, DWF said they're going to double that to a thousand. They've now got um, uh, an offsite building, um, and it's just fascinating how they are really doubling down on this alter- on their own um, alternative legal services. Their partners are now, in effect, they're, they're <laughs> I clarified with them that although they're listed and they're running as a company, they still have that partnership culture where they have a choice to talk about managed services. There's no, there's no like stick, you know, I was wondering whether they had to sort of incorporate, but actually it seems almost quite refreshingly <laughs> like they still operate as a partnership. They still can go, nah, I think my way is better. <laughs> there's still a bit of that, but they, <laughs> but they do um, increasingly, they, they're using managed services, they're using connected services, they're using ventures, um, which is their innovation arm. And it's really making a difference to their bottom line, which is, which is cool. It's, it was cool to see. 
Yeah. I think it's interesting too, as a question of how we evaluate firms and the size of firms and the revenue that they bring in. Um, I know at ALM, there's definitely some conversation of, so if some of these captive ALSPs get large enough to make a material difference, how does that affect the AMLAW 100, 200 rankings? How do you make sure that revenue is counted, not counted? If something like Atrium actually were to blow up and happen again, how do you rank something that is half law firm, half legal services provider? It's an interesting question. And as a lot of people like DWF start to have material revenue that is connected, it's going to be something that I think a lot of people are going to have to grapple with. Is there an, but what's really interesting, I thought you might pick me up on this. <laughs> Thank you for not. Was <laughs> about the, so, that, so what's interesting, it, it's almost immaterial because what we're talking about is the fact of why, you know, where their, their growth is coming from. But a lot of the growth is not organic. So they've got these great, you know, I get impressed by the, the total figures, but actually they bought Mindcraft. So, and a lot of the, um, I struggle with accounting sometimes. But, so they, um, a, lot, <laughs> a lot of growth is not, is not organic growth, right? So the actual growth, um, the growth from connected services was really, so I think the connected services itself has grown something like 19%. But the, anyway, the, this it's more complicated. It's not as, perhaps, you know, as completely as it looks on the service, because obviously they've bought companies, but, Nonetheless, the underlying point, and Zach, you know, I mean, in the UK, DWF is one of the top 100 firms. You know, we we don't perhaps have the same, but I take your point. You know, it's it's really interesting that they're a they're a they're a, a complete hybrid, um, and it's fascinating to see that part of their business grow. The guy that I spoke to has come over from RBS, the got the chief executive of managed services. He's a really sort of impressive guy. He's come over from, um, he used to head, I forget which division, um, RBS. And um, you know, they, they mean business. Um, so it's, re- and it's, kind of, it's really cool to see because, you know, they're providing, they're using a lot of, t- oh, what's also cool. So they've got this team in India who play around with technology, right? So, so, so their de- managers are tech agnostic. They, they don't, and they're, they're not claiming to be, you know, in bed with one particular vendor. And right. they kind of pride themselves on that. And they're saying we constantly, they've got a team in India whose job is constantly to evaluate technology and work out which is the best technology. And, and so one of the things that they believe differentiates themselves is being completely agnostic, but on top of the latest developments and why this is better for your project, you know, whether it be e-discovery or whatever it might be, um, which is which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, while, we're, while we're in Europe, uh, Zach, you had to, do you want to talk about Bright Flag? Yeah, sure. Uh, just briefly, Bright Flag raised $28 million this week, um, bringing their total funding to somewhere around $40 million, um, if Crunchbase is to be believed. Um, I just thought it was interesting. We talk a lot about, obviously, the internationalization of legal tech. Uh, historically, being in the U.S., I feel like I've taken probably a U.S.-centric view to startups, but increasingly, people who do that are solely misguided. Uh, or increasingly misguided. Uh, Bright Flag is Dublin-based company. And when we talked to them, they basically said, yeah, we have a foothold over in Europe. We feel strongly with our legal management system over here. The US is our next goal. And we think we can take on the US-based companies and within the next three to five years, be a standard. Um, So obviously big words, It'll remain to be seen whether they can actually take this funding and do that. But I thought it was interesting just the different reaches in different places. We are starting to see people try and international or mm-hmm. become international. Yeah. It, it maybe it is a bit of US centricity in the sense that I, so many of these international companies do want to get into the US market. Uh, that seems to be a goal for a number of them. It, I mean, it's it's obviously a major market, but there are plenty of major markets outside the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, Asia Pacific in particular, that's, that's been really big for some of these companies. But uh, yeah, and I, I remember even when I was uh, over in, in Russia a couple of years ago, it's like you meet all these little legal tech startups in Russia and they're all talking about how they're going to expand their products to the United States. I'm like... I'm not sure you're really fully aware of what the political climate is uh, in the United States. Uh, we, we may not be wanting to trust all our data to a Russian company right now, but. 
speaking of political climate, we should we should clarify. So when he's talking about Europe, Caroline, like that's a that's an area of the world that we can still trade with after the end of the year. <laughs> I know that you may not be able to. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Do you know what you're laughing? I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> Joe yeah. is our friend. Joe is our friend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nikki, uh, you had a, another uh, another ethics opinion. They've been cranking them out lately, yeah. but uh, well, I love to follow the intersection of tech and ethics and privacy and law. And um, but I like to follow the ethics opinions that relate to technology and lawyers and also COVID. Um, there's a lot of interesting COVID-related opinions coming down. This one just echoes one I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Both of them were out of New York. The first was a New York State Bar. This one is a New York City Bar. And they both uh, addressed the issue of whether lawyers could withdraw as counsel due to health-related concerns um, when they're forced to appear in person, um, you know, health-related concerns that have to do with COVID. And what the, if you were on the uh, round table where I talked about the New York State Bar, what their opinion said was that or what they opined was that um, that it is grounds to withdraw from a case. It's and then they said that you had to get the court's permission to do so. Um, essentially, saying that your fear, uh, your health-related fears for appearing in court, could affect uh, how you represent your client. Uh, so, you know, the quality of representation, you might rush through a hearing, you might try to get the client to plea bargain, you might adjourn the case indefinitely, you know, which can uh, affect the client's case. Right. And so if you believe that it was going to affect your ability to represent your client, then you could request permission. The New York City Bar took a different tact. Uh, they still concluded that you could withdraw because of health related concerns, but they uh, said that it was a con it created a conflict of interest in that situation. So it wasn't necessarily a permissive, uh, you didn't need permission to do so. So it wasn't a permissive withdrawal. Um, and the reason I think that they're both interesting, not only is it a COVID related ethics issue, that's uh, certainly valid, especially now that there are surges going on across the country and especially in New York, both downstate and upstate now, we're about to go into the red zone where I live People, uh, you know, we're going remote again, but there are still some in-person court appearances happening. Uh, it, I think it's it's relevant also because it's a tech issue because you don't necessarily need these in-person court appearances if you've got the tech set up, which the courts increasingly are doing. They had them before and they're uh, setting it up even more now because of COVID. But at the end of the day, uh, for the vast majority of these um, situations, you don't need to be in court. And right now when lawyers are legitimately concerned about their health, um, it, they shouldn't have to be in court. And I was just on a, um, uh, I'm very actively involved in our local bar in Monroe County and, I, um, and I'm on the board of trustees and I have to be a liaison to two committees. One of them is the criminal justice committee. And so I was part of their meeting yesterday and they brought in the supervising judge of Monroe County courts to talk about um, what's happening in the courts because of COVID, you know, how they'd handled a jury trial a couple of weeks ago and the precautions that they took and what was gonna be happening going forward. And um, they're also concerned about uh, visiting clients in the jails and trying to get clients out of jail on habeas corpus petitions uh, because a lot of, um, of the rates that are increasing in the jail. So, you know, the health related issues are on everyone's mind um, and litigators in particular are concerned. And so it just interested me and I posted a link to the New York City Bar's um, opinion in the chat and I just wrote about it for the Daily Record and it was published online today and will be in the newspaper on Monday. That being said, it's behind a paywall. I'll be republishing it to my blog uh, sui generis, um, New York law blog dot type pad dot com. Uh, I'm in the near future. So if you want to actually read my article on it or just read the opinion that I linked to. I, it's interesting, uh, Nikki, I stumbled across this, this, just this week, a two day online seminar put on by NIDA uh, about how to try case jury cases online. Um, and the thing that was really interesting about it is they had a number of panelists and so many of them were lawyers and judges who had in fact tried a jury case online. I, I thought it was kind of an anomaly, but it, it began, it seems to be happening more and more. And if they did had not done a complete trial online, they, they had done portions of the trial online, like, like jury selection and, and things of that sort. Um, 
but it, it uh, and, and I, I have a, a friend out in Seattle who's getting ready to try a three months trial all online. Um, so, I, you know, it'll be, a, it's an interesting question whether in, in the criminal context is different, but in a civil context, does the judge have the ability to order an online trial? Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it sounded like most of these panelists were the cases they were involved in. It was done by consent. Everybody agreed. But um, but it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. The longer this goes on, the more of that I think we're going to see. Yeah. I saw it interesting. I was on a panel, uh, not a panel. I was on a call earlier this week. I'm on a committee of judges and media people here in Massachusetts. And there were some judges talking about what it's been like to operate in, in, in the COVID world. Uh, and one judge was talking about the fact that he's about to resume uh, on a very limited basis, live uh, some criminal hearings uh, and his concern, and I, I don't know the answer to this, I haven't had a chance to look into it, but was was whether, um, since the order is that anybody going to a courtroom has to wear a mask, uh, does does wearing does does a witness against a defendant wearing a mask uh, violate the defendant's right to confront their accusers, their constitutional right to confront their accusers if they can't clearly see who that person is because they're behind a mask? I thought that was yeah, an interesting they issue. They removed heard them about that. often. They talked about that in, in the... Uh, yeah. No, but this judge would say they can't... Quite a bit. Their order is they have to leave the mask on all at all times in the courtroom, oh. all, everybody in the yeah. courtroom. But one of the well, points I mean, that was made line, in the, the seminar are... was that, um, you know, it, 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 there's this argument that if you're online, you can't assess the witness's credibility and demeanor and all that kind of stuff. But the judges, some of the judges pointed out, oh, look, if we do an in-person trial because of social distancing you know, the, the jurors are pretty far away from the witness. Right. And yeah. it, it could be even worse that, because they can't really see the facial expressions of the witness, irrespective of the mask issue, which is a completely different different thing. Although uh, I have a lawyer, another lawyer who's a friend is going to try, was trying a, a case in person. And he had one of these clear plastic masks, which are kind of yeah. interesting, I think, but I haven't been bought one. So Molly, uh, what were you going to say? Yeah, sorry, Molly. No, I was just going to say, if the defendant is blind, does that mean that um, they can't ever be prosecuted? I feel like that doesn't yeah. even make sense to me. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, hey, hey, I I know we're out of time, but Molly, I have to ask because I, I hadn't seen the story. What is this about smoking now allowed in the <laughs> in the office and in no. court thanks to Zoom? <laughs> well. I was just saying, I've seen so many, I've been involved in so many more meetings and now there's been a court hearing uh, with the Maryland Court of Appeals where somebody was filmed uh, because of Zoom smoking during the session. I've been at lots of meetings and calls where people are now smoking, which is in their office. So smoking is now allowed in the office <laughs> because of Zoom. <laughs> And this is the first time in the court didn't say they didn't say anything about it. She just kept the <laughs> she just kept smoking away. <laughs> so well, it was pretty awesome. And then I also it was the first time I'd ever seen these red robes um, in Maryland court. And there's a oh. I, I shared a with you guys. I can post it in the comments, the Twitter thread that really goes quickly from the smoking to the um, um, to the uh, discussion of the red robes. Yeah. All right. Well, uh uh, not not at, not as bad as some of the things we've talked about that have happened on Zoom uh, lately, but well, I think that does it for uh, our time today. Anybody else uh, have anything else they wanted to uh, raise before we wrap up? All right. Well, just thanks to every I just solved the witness problem. That's all. I put it in the chat. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh quick! Man. Perfect. Joe saves the day. <laughs> All right. Yeah, and I did put the I think I put the right link to the media, the Maryland courts uh, thing in the chat there too. All mm -hmm. right. Thanks to everybody. We will be back again next week with uh, who knows yeah. what will happen next week, but we will, uh, <laughs> we will talk about it on Friday. See you all then. Thanks guys. Bye. Bye.